I'm continuing the series of talks I've been giving on dialectics, the accounts of dialectics given by Stone and Mao, Engels, and I'm now covering a bit of what Lenin says insofar as Mao quotes him. When reading Mao, you have to realise that he was a poet and he writes poetically and there's a lot of allusions in what he says. You can't just simply take words at their face value. Just before he wrote on contradiction, he wrote a poem called Mountains. Mountain. Peaks pierce the green sky unblunted. The sky would fall but for the columns of the mountains. So when we are looking at Mao and looking at the citations from Lenin, what he has cited from Lenin has some problems, but it does give an insight into what Mao means by the characters which have been translated into on contradiction, uh, to, in, translated into contradiction in the English ed edition. The, that these things could be validly translated as conflict was pointed out to me as by a viewer who made the comment that the, the two characters that Mao uses could equally well be translated as conflict. So on contradiction could be translated as on conflict. But as I say, in the section on the universality of contradictions or the universality of conflict, Mao quotes a number of points from Lenin. And this is a list of five points that Lenin had as examples of dialectics. And they are sourced from a couple of pages of notes on dialectics, which was not something that Lenin ever published, but they were his own private notes made sometime around 20, 1916 and which had been published by the time Mao was writing. So in these notes, there are five examples and that's all that Mao quotes. These examples are one, examples of dialectics in maths, plus and minus, differential and integral. Two, in mechanics, action and reaction. Three, in physics, positive and negative electricity. In chemistry, combination, dissociation of atoms. And in social science, the class struggle. Now, as I say, these are drawn from some brief notes of Lenin. The first one, he's talking about maths, which is a human art or technology or technique. The other three are statements about the natural sciences, that is to say about the world as it exists independently of human beings as discovered by the natural sciences. There's a difference between the natural sciences and maths. And the final one is drawn from historical materials, the, from social science, as Lenin says, by which he means historical materials. Now let's go through these one by one. In maths, plus and minus, well, addition and subtraction multiplication and division, differentiation and integration are examples of what in maths are termed inverse operations or inverse operators. So if alpha and beta are inverse operators, then if we take a alpha beta, sorry, a alpha b, beta b, we get a. The effect of beta b 
cancels out the effect of alpha B. And it's quite reasonable under those circumstances to call these opposite operations. If we substitute in plus and minus for alpha and beta, this is going to be valid. If we substitute in um, multiplication division, it's going to be valid. So it's quite reasonable to call these opposite operations. But as I say, arithmetic is a technical art. It's something which involves physical tokens. Um, it used to involve beads. Later it involved signs in ledgers. At the time when Mao and Lenin were writing, commercial arithmetic in China and Russia were done using an abacus. And when you perform an addition, in this case we have the abacus indicating the number 53 and we're going to add 2 to it to get 55. So what we do is we slide two beads from right to left and it now reads 55. So that's 53 plus 2 gives us 55. To subtract we do the inverse operation and move two beads to the right. So it's a physical manipulation of objects that is involved in arithmetic. It's less evident um, to us nowadays because we're used to writing it down with Arabic numbers, but it's still a physical manipulation because it's a physical manipulation of signs. And if you use a computer or a calculator, it's a physical manipulation of electric currents. So when you get addition followed by subtraction, you end up with the same state that you started out with. This is the initial state, the final state is the same. And the, it's an inverse operation because it returns you to the starting state. And it's this return to the starting state that in this case, allows us to treat addition and subtraction as being opposites or inverse operations. Now this is all fairly basic. Why am I labouring it? It's because there are problems with this example. It's easy to come up with operators in mathematics that are not inverses. In logic, the two basic operations that you learn are AND and OR. And these are basic operators but they're not inverse. So A and B or B is not equal to A. It's actually equal to B. So why claim that the opposite operations are fundamental? They're not fundamental. This is actually cherry picking you to support an argument. It's picking just those maths operators which do appear to be opposites. Well, it's, it's, it is a cherry picking because it's arbitrary to claim the unity of opposites is fundamental to maths because maths has, it does have inverse operators, but it has other important operators as well. So perhaps there's another way of looking at this. If we go back to the idea that addition and subtraction return an abacus or calculator to its starting state, is that what is required for a unity of opposites? Is it this return to the starting state that um, is what Len is getting at? Does a return to a starting state always require two opposite operations? Now it'd be easy to think of that if you're just considering addition, abstract, subtraction, multiplication and division. But there are other mathematical operators where this doesn't apply. Consider the operation of rotation. I've drawn three circles here, colour wheel circles. Between the first and second colour wheel there's a 180 degree rotation. I've rotated the wheel 
halfway round. I then rotate it another halfway round and it gets back to the starting state. And an arithmetic an analogue of this would be multiplying by minus one. Apply that twice and you get back to your starting number. So the idea of a return to the starting state doesn't establish the necessity of unity of opposites either. Sometimes the same operation returns you to the starting state. If you're, if you're familiar with quantum computing, there's an operator which involves rotation by I of the, 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 the state of the system. And the uh, I is a square root of minus one. You apply it four times, you get back to the starting state. So the idea that opposites are necessary to get back to the starting state is not fundamental because in fact, in the real world, rotation, repetition, is something that is absolutely fundamental to reality. The world goes round, the world goes round the sun, you get cyclic re, uh, re, vibration in atoms, you get uh, cyclic phenomena in electromagnetic waves. Rotation is as fundamental as you could say opposites are. Now let's look at these examples two, three, and four. Action and reaction, positive and negative charge, and combination and dissociation do have something in common. But if you talk about unity of opposites, you only get a partial account of what they really have in common. You're missing out the most important thing. And this is something which comes from mechanics. You're missing out that these are all ways of expressing or consequences of underlying conservation laws. If you take the example of action and reaction, well, Newton says to every action there's an equal and positive reaction. But why is that? It's in order to preserve the conservation of momentum, or not in order to preserve the conservation of momentum. Because momentum is conserved, action and reaction have to be equal to one another. The Earth and the Moon exert equal and opposite gravitational forces on one another. And in consequence, there's no internally generated net force acting on the pair. If it wasn't for the gravitational force of the Sun, the orbiting Earth and Moon would continue in a straight line. Their centre of gravity would continue in a straight line because their joint momentum has to be conserved. So the action and reaction that Newton establishes as a postulate is actually a postulate he has to establish in order to sustain his deeper concept of the conservation of momentum, which is one of his fundamental laws. If we take positive and negative electricity, this again arises from a conservation law, which is the con law of conservation of charge. Consider a process, a natural process, which creates positive and negative charge. And we'll take the example of the de decay of carbon-14, which is what you use in carbon, carbon dating. Carbon-14 has a charge of plus six because it's carbon. It undergoes beta decay, that is to say it emits an electron very slowly with a long half, relatively long half-life, which is why it's useful for dating. And it decays into nitrogen, which has a positive charge in the nucleus of seven and releases an electron. If we add the charges though, the charges still amount to six, seven in the nucleus, minus one on the electron, so the net charge is six. So the positive and negative electricity are a consequence of the 
fact that in all nuclear transitions, the total net charge has to remain unchanged. It is a consequence of the law of conservation of charge. Chemical conservation is also what's be behind the issue of association and disassociation of elements. It's the fact that in a chemical reaction, the total number of atoms in each element can't change. We're leaving out radioactive decay, which does allow chemical elements to change. But in a purely chemical process, the total number of atoms must, change, must remain unchanged. So the three middle examples that then gives do have something in common. They have in common, they're what science calls a conservative process. And talking about the dialectical principle of unity of opposites derived from Hegel misses the point. Hegel didn't really understand the fundamental principles of mechanics and made a terrible hash of his critique of Newton. If you want to seek out the philosophical origins of their common property, it's not in Hegel. It's in the um, motto of Lucretius that nothing comes from nothing, which Marx explicitly quotes in Capital. And he explicitly quotes it because it's relevant to the final point. Class conflict. This too relates to conservation. But conservation at the social level, not at the level of the natural sciences. The point is that the labour force in every society is finite. The number of hours a day that people can work is also bounded. It's obviously far less than 24. It follows from this that the social working day, as Marx call it, is a fixed resource. And that an increase in surplus labour means a reduction in necessary labour and vice versa. An increase in necessary labour time means a reduction in surplus labour time. Again, we've got the principle that two components must sum to a constant. And that's why the class conflict between capital and labour is ultimately unresolvable. It's because the income of capital and the income of labour are subdivided parts of a greater whole. All of the examples that relate to the world rather than to an art are examples that come from conservation laws. At some point, I may do a video on what I think are the fundamental principles underlying the mechanical materialist world outlook. But that'll do for now. I'll get on to more stuff talking about Mao and Lenin in another video.